Mm -hmm. Our focus on climate change is an example of the simplistic way the human mind operates in a simple one-on-one -on -one linear cause-effect kind of relationship. And as I say, the emphasis on climate change is distraction, not just because it's simplistic and, and, and ignores the bigger problem, but because the more we focus on climate change, the less we're solving the climate problem, mm. the more we're exacerbating overshoot. So everything we're doing to fix climate because of our fixation on it is actually adding to the climate problem. Uh, electric vehicles are no solution to the climate problem. Wind and solar power are no solution to the climate problem. You, we think they are because we socially construct these myths about 100% renewable energy by 2050. It, it's simply not working either to solve the climate problem or to address overshoot. So some sociologists or ecological economists have said that the way we're approaching the climate problem involves massive investment. It's being sold on the basis of huge profit-making opportunities mm -hmm. in terms of uh, cre uh, job creation and so on and so forth. So again, it's the self-reference back into the beliefs, values, and assumptions of techno-industrial society, which keeps perpetuating the same kind of uh, mythic constructs that are destroying the planet in the first place. Gentlemen. Hello. Bill. Hello. Great. Great to have you. Hello. How are you? Hi. Good. Thanks. Yeah, we're doing so 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 delighted to have you, Bill. It's, it's so thanks for making the time. Hope your bike ride was okay this morning. Or did you just get... got back? Oh, good, good, excellent. Just just so you know, I, so hi, nice to meet you properly over Zoom. Um, I'm Carrie, and and this is Thomas. Nice just so you. just so you we know who's who. Um, and oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, and I just wanted to say at the top too. Thanks again for you know when I when we earlier reached out to you about. You, you know, your willingness to be part of that, you know, that shirk little project that's coming together and, you know, the funding news yeah. will be released anytime and, you know, we'll, 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 we'll give you a heads up. So just, so stay, stay tuned. <laughs> and, uh, all right. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And you, so, so th yeah, no, again, thanks, Bill. We've been, we've been a, a fan of your work for honestly some time and, and, we yeah we've we've always had questions you know in our mind circling for you so so um um we we have we have a several things that we kind of want to you know um talk to you about the first kind of big topic being maybe not one that you're necessarily super excited to talk about but um the sort of the big thing I was talking to you about the big educational failure the widespread educational failure um responding to overshoot the complete inability of any kind of level of education to respond to overshoot um you know as you say in your uh your 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 paper there about cognitive obsolescence um how is it that we're the most scientifically aware best informed globally hyper-connected generation decision makers ordinary people yet we're completely incapable of applying most basic rules of evidence resolving any you know this this predicament so I just want to kind of talk to you about that, like, you know, um, or we, we want to talk to you just as a just to start things off, perhaps like um, these theories of cognitive obsolescence you have um, that what is the root? You know, you've been doing this for so long. What is what is the root of this educational failure for you, for your for you? And and one thing I've often thought about is just just to kind of get it started is how education mostly works in the service of creating elites, you know, creating uh, elite members of society. Um, uh, our historian Peter Turchin calls this elite overproduction. Um, and it just kind of seems that education feeds directly into the problem of growth and overshoot um, in so many ways. And can we just maybe start by hearing your thoughts on that? And yeah. Is that good? Yeah. Very good. <laughs> well, <clears throat> okay. Yeah, well, that's a huge question. Um, Anywhere you want to start. At one there. point in my academic Okay, in my academic career, I was at one point uh, the director of a program at School of Planning at UBC. And we used to have annual, meet, or not annual, monthly meetings, heads of units, conducted by the Dean of Education, 
I'm sorry, it was the, it was the Associate Vice President of Research at UBC. And uh, he would conduct these meetings and I was a new boy on the block and said very little for a while. But I noticed almost all of the meetings were about fundraising. How do we get more money? How do we make the university more attractive to the private sector? Uh, how did we engage in more kind of participatory projects and research that would further industry and so on? So I finally spoke up and said, look, uh, should we not be talking a little bit about the curriculum of the university and, and what we teach? Uh, here we have a, a world in crisis and all we're talking about is raising money. And uh, there was dead silence in the room. And <laughs> he took me aside later. This is a vice president research and said, look, you seem to have an old fashioned view of the university, one that suggests that universities lead in how societies respond to problems and so on. The fact is, he argued that the education system was much more a reflection of society than it was the creator mm -hmm. of the paradigm. Uh, that really took me aback, but it seems that it, it's really uh, true and, and part of the answer to your question. So basically what we're dealing with here, I call this um, self-reference. We live in what I've called, or a number of us call, a modern techno-industrial society. And it's based on a, a, a whole series of beliefs, values, assumptions, norms, and behaviors that are automatic. But we just learn them by virtue of growing up in our particular culture. So if you were to ask anyone on the street, what, what's your paradigm? They wouldn't know what you're talking about, but we're acting out of a paradigm, a way of thinking all the time. I mean, it's just something that, that we've acquired. And now the problem is that if you're confronted with a major problem caused by the way your worldview is causing society to act out in the world, how do you solve it? Well, you go back into the toolbox that created the problem in the first place. And this is what I mean by self-reference. We simply keep referring to the same beliefs, values, assumptions, and behaviors, the social norms that, that created the problem. Uh, there's any number of ways of characterizing this. You know, was it Einstein who said uh, insanity is, is measured by doing something the same way over and over again and expecting different results? And that's basically what we're in here. So yeah, our, our education system churns out young people who are versed in the same beliefs, values, assumptions, and cultural norms that are the cause of the problems that are confronting us right now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So somewhere a couple of hundred years ago, we got off on a, on a wrong tack, by which I mean one in terms of the ecological issues I'm concerned with. It's a tack that is completely... Uh, at odds with the fundamental functioning of the ecosphere. So we have a societal system, primarily now a neoliberal economic system, whose internal operating assumptions are completely at odds with the way the ecosphere operates. Uh, let, just let me give you a very simple example. Economic models make no useful reference to the biophysical environment. They contain no useful information about the uh, structure, temporal dynamics, uh, complex behaviors, and so on of the ecosphere. In fact, they don't even map well to society. So here we're trying to run the world using a, a conceptual model, uh, an economic model, but, you know, capitalism, I, I suppose neoliberal economics is the handmaiden of capitalism. It's this growth-oriented uh, material accumulation model of the world um, that is interacting with the world and yet contains no useful information about the world. So what are, uh, to put this more simply, the economy contains no useful information about the ecosphere and very little about the society with which the economy actually interacts in the real world. Mm -hmm. What could possibly go wrong? It's a complete shipwreck when you get right down to it. That's what we're beginning to experience now. Mm -hmm. uh, I call it, uh, in, in ecological terms, it's the phenomenon of overshoot. But of course, overshoot itself is caused by this complete uh, dysfunctional relationship, the fundamental adversity between economic processes, we've defined it 
and the way the ecosphere and society actually operate. Mm -hmm. and our education system keeps churning out people who believe this in, in science, economics, in engineering, no matter where you look. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, th well, thanks for getting us started there, Bill. I mean, that was a great, that was a great, honestly, great start. Um, Tom is honestly has some questions coming up about um, how we might bring this out of whack economic system down to earth somehow. Um, and uh, part of that, I think, has to do with ecological footprint analysis, which was something that's so kind of, you know, insightful about EFA is, is how it connects to land appropriation, how much land you actually need. And so we'll get to a question about land value tax and, and, and taxation mm -hmm. in a moment. But before, I just want to ask you one little question related to what you just said. So, so the wheels are coming off, so to speak, as you've talked about for a long time. And, and if you, and there's a little figure there, you know, in, in, um, in the PDF that I, we put in the chat that kind of sort of talks about very simply, after a great acceleration, after all this overshoot, we will inevitably reach certain threshold, certain limits to growth, and there will be a kind of social forms of social and environmental unraveling that we have to uh, navigate. So my question for you is, if this is more or less inevitable, this unraveling, this this sort of, you know, that comes about because of this, you know, this, this, end, this drive towards endless growth, um, maybe the educational question becomes more and more reconfigured around what does it mean to live well in a time of social and environmental unraveling? And do you, as somebody who's been doing this so long, do you, do you have a sense of what living well looks like here? And, you, and maybe, maybe this is not where you, but just, yeah, I just want to put it out there. Well, living well is defined differently in every culture you can talk about. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it, number one, yeah. <laughs> okay. So our, our particular culture, this so-called techno-industrial culture, living well means having a lot of stuff. We, we measure our well-being often in terms of the quantity of material uh, wealth that, that surrounds us, our number of cars, the size of our house, uh, and so on and so forth. It's, it's just that what we used to call conspicuous consumption. Mm -hmm. So that's one measure of well-being. But of course, it's not a very good measure of well-being in a state of overshoot. The fact of the matter is that overconsumption by, say, a quarter of the people on the planet has already, already assumed or taken up most of the annual productivity of Earth, which is part of the reason for overshoot. Maybe we should clarify what we mean by overshoot. Please, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In ecological terms, and, and re particular reference to the human enterprise, a state of overshoot exists when consumption of energy and material resources by the human system exceeds the production of bio resources by the ecosphere and the assimilative capacity of the environment to uh, take up our wastes. So what we're doing is both destroying the productive basis of our system, as well as polluting the uh, rest of the system so that we're further undermining the biophysical capacity of the ecosphere to support life. And we're fundamentally undermining our own existence. Uh, we don't notice that so much in very rich countries because the, the capitalist uh, system has created something called globalization and trade. So many countries in Europe, in fact, almost all major countries in Europe are in a vast state of overshoot using vastly more productivity imported from elsewhere than they could sustain from within their own territories. So countries can enter into overshoot and we cover up the problems it introduces uh, through trade. So if, if you are interconnected globally through a trade system, you lose interest in protecting your local ecosystems because it doesn't matter what happens to them. You can always import the necessities of life from somewhere else. And by the way, that's what we're doing here in the lower mainland of British Columbia, paving over our best agricultural land on grounds that it's cheaper to import food from someplace else. But of course, someplace else may be doing exactly the same thing. Anyway, the bottom line is that, that trade enables a relatively few, relatively wealthy people to gain access to the last remaining pockets of productivity on the planet and continue to live in ways that do two things. First of all, it draws down though that excess capacity in the exporting regions, but it also blinds people to their dependence on ecosystems in their own regions. So it's really the worst of two worlds. It creates a disincentive to conserve locally 
while we're at the same time uh, reducing productivity elsewhere. And by the way, preventing other people from enjoying the benefits of their own uh, national productivity. Mm. So what we do, with the whole world hits the, the, the ceiling at the same time. And so we see the, the drawdown of global fisheries, the destruction of soils. Some say that we only have 25 or 30 years of productive soils left, for example, and, and so on. The problem is that the ecosphere over time has built up enormous reserves of various forms of what we call natural capital, the soils, the forests, oil and gas, and so on. So we can live on that stuff for a hell of a long time, but we're just depleting, if you will, the bank account. And at some point, we come up with insufficient funds to finance our current operations. And that's the direction in which we're headed. We're going to have an energy crisis, and that's going to be terminal for uh, techno-industrial society. Most people, again, because you know we've had abundant cheap energy for about 200 years, and that's all we completely lost track of the fact that the entire growth of Western culture, of, of, of industrial culture, is energy dependent. And when that energy uh, runs out, the whole system implodes. And no matter what you've heard of in, in recent times about alternative green energy, there's no conceivable way it can substitute for the benefits of fossil fuel in the short time that we have available. And by the way, if it did, it would be catastrophic for the planet anyway. Yeah. So we're uh, a triple, double bind, if that doesn't make uh, <laughs> nonsense of what, what I'm saying here. No, no, I, you, you know, and, and we've looked a lot at the, you know, we in our own work on the unsustainable green transition that's being sort of forced down our <laughs> our plates, I guess. Um, but yeah, no, that you've really articulated overshoot and the problems we're facing well, including, you know, impending energy, mineral shortfalls and, and everything around that. So maybe, Thomas, this is a time to kind of bring in some of your questions around well, around land use, around farming, any of those mm -hmm. things. Yeah, I'll try. Yeah, do uh -huh. that. Yeah. So uh, maybe my first question would be just talking about the economic question. Um, how might you consider? I, I hear it in economics conversations a lot, especially around the Georgist um, land tax thing, yeah. where everyone's talking about efficiency and highest and best use of land. Um, but I, I'm curious how you might think of highest and best use of land, because I feel like there might be a contradiction there where everyone's looking for more productivity, but that comes at a cost to the environment and the ecology around us. And so if we were to reframe highest and best use of land uh, in a way that acknowledges this uh, sustainability issue, how, how, how would we look at that logically? It's a, it's a huge and important mm. question. And it's, it typically, when it, an economist speaks of highest and best use, they mean that use of that land, which can return the highest or the, the largest amount to capital. So there's a capital value in that land. How can we use that land to get the highest return? Mm. So if you're thinking of... Uh, well, first of all, you have to understand we've commodified land here. It just becomes just like any other <clears throat> resource. So if I'm sitting on a piece of property on the edge of Vancouver, and I have an option between growing carrots and uh, converting it to a shopping plaza, and my criterion for making that decision is the returns to capital on a per acre basis or per hectare basis, clearly I'm going to uh, convert to urban uses. Mm -hmm. So people have an enormous incentive in, in the financial context mm -hmm. to uh, convert urban land in the periphery to urban uses because urban land values in our normal economic accounting mm -hmm. are much higher and the capacity of that land in various urban uses to generate returns on investment in the land much higher than say agriculture. And we get into a bit of a mess here because Again, we've commodified everything. So if we think of agriculture in North America, at the farm gate, the value of food is about 0.5 or 0.6% of GDP. So we, we've got a, a really weird conundrum here mm -hmm. in that nothing is more important than food. And yet we have an economic system that devalues it completely. 
Mm -hmm. in, in relative to many other things. And so uh, we've recently had a Nobel Prize awarded to William Nordhaus, who, for example, argued that, look, climate change is most likely to affect agriculture, forestry, and fisheries more than anything else. And altogether, they only amount to about 4 or 5% of gross national product. So we could lose them all. wouldn't make, make any difference because mm. after two or three years of growth, uh, we'd recover the, the economic losses. Well, th that's economic nonsense in many respects, because as soon as those things began to disappear, their prices would rise, and so their valuation would increase as well. But the bottom line is it takes into account it doesn't take into account the fact that food is a vital and absolute necessity for all of us. It's only cheap in the economic sense because we're so good at producing it in, in the short term. But you, you get my main point. If you have an economic system that values everything in the marketplace right now, then you don't have any way of, of, of really measuring the value that that might have in the future. So suppose 15, 20 years from now, we're very short of energy. Most of our agriculture is dependent on fossil fuel inputs. Yeah. We need every hectare of, of viable land to grow food because productivity may well decline in the absence of pesticides, fertilizers, uh, diesel powered tractors, irrigation, and so on and so forth. Suddenly th that future value of land skyrockets, but because we have a very uh, high discount rate, we don't regard it as such at, at present. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is discounting the future value of land so that it's virtually nothing in today's marketplace, which gives us the uh, green light to go ahead and develop it, mm -hmm. future damned. So that, that's a natural tendency of human beings. It, it's it, so-called discounting the future. Economists have formalized it, of course. But what it means is that politicians and policymakers would much rather impose a huge cost on future generations are people far away, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. small cost on, on present generations in their own home turf, who, you know, people are going to vote for them. So discounting this, this natural tendency to um, think of the here and now, which by the way, was highly adaptive 10,000 years ago when there was no refrigeration and, and, and nothing changed anyway. Uh, it's become very maladaptive in a world of rapid change where the future may become extremely important and is arriving very quickly. Mm -hmm. So again, many of our natural tendencies, even those that have been converted into economics, for example, are maladaptive in today's world, which gets to the point of my little essay on the cognitive obsolescence of the human brain. Yeah, I know, which is lovely, which is lovely and and right to the point is so, so cut and dry in a, in a really good way. Um, to, to build on Thomas's question here, with I, I think sure. maybe there's yeah. a little um, idea we'd like to you know put to you. Um, we we've recently sort of um, been exposed to a way of framing human social economic relations. Uh, you know, not necessarily using the terms global north, global south, but as instead metropolis and periphery. Um, some scholars we know have used this language. Um, um, in, in, it seems to connect um, a little in our minds to EFA, uh, Ecological Footprint Analysis, and the issue of land appropriation in the sense that, um, um, yeah, d um, is this a different way of thinking about, you know, these extractivist relationships across the world, you know, especially given some of your work, uh, uh, the fact that, um, and I'm I'm sorry I'm reading your question, Thomas. That's so I'm just taking your words, but <laughs> but I'm just taking the the yeah the fame here. But um but um a, a link to um you know metropolis is especially linked to mega cities like Tokyo, which I know you looked at pretty early on, um and other mega cities um are expanding just across the globe, and they're as we've said they're all pursuing resources, raw min raw materials, products via global trade from outside themselves the periphery. And 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 from each other, from other metropolises. So, um, yeah, what do you think of this framing, especially in relation to EFA? And does this present any other way of thinking about how we could conceivably move away from this intense energy material waste interdependence that we're talking about here? Well, it's another way of looking at the same thing. But what yeah. I call footprint analysis, for those who don't know, showed what we've tried to do here 
Let me back up a bit. Yeah, you should. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Mainstream economics tends to measure things in terms of monetary flows. Um, this misses a great deal about the biophysical world. So we have a, a myth out there, for example, that uh, the economy is dematerializing, that we're becoming less and less resource dependent. Uh, we call this decoupling. The economy is decoupling from the environment. And it, it's based on, uh, for example, using fewer resources per unit GDP produced, or the fewer emissions going into the air per unit GDP pr produced. And if you can maintain this trend, of course, you can dematerialize and carry on growing ad infinitum. Mm -hmm. But to my way of thinking, it's, it's a false measure. It's a monetary measure that doesn't mean a whole lot in biophysical terms. So what I tried to do with ecological footprint analysis was to look at actual material and energy flows. Now, other people have done this as well, so I'm not saying that this was a brilliant breakthrough, but we did it in a, a slightly different way. So our question was, okay, how much of the Earth's surface is dedicated? How much of the productive ecosystem area on the planet is dedicated to supporting any defined population at its current material standard? You can pick any material standard you want. And so we began to look at the actual material flows from a population to the land in terms of pollution and so on, and from the land back to that population. And so to make a long story short, an ecological footprint is the physical area of productive land and water ecosystems needed to produce the bioresources consumed by a population and to assimilate its, its carbon wastes, basically. So when you look at things this way, uh, we are not dematerializing at all. Our eco footprints, as in incomes increase, get steadily bigger. So, in the biophysical real world, we see an increasing connection between humankind and the ecosphere, and one that's becoming greater and greater. In the economic world, we're decoupling. So, again, nothing could be more opposed than these two visions mm. of reality. By the way, it, it comes up in another way. Um, if you look at the biomass of human beings on the planet, you're going back to pre-industrial, in fact, at pre-agricultural times, humans constituted perhaps 1% or less the total mammalian biomass on Earth. Leap forward to the present day, we're something like 33%. Our domestic livestock are another 62 or 3%. So altogether, human beings plus domestic livestock are now 97% or thereabouts of the biomass of mammals on Earth, up from 1%. Meanwhile, wild mammals have gone from 99% down to 3 or 4% at most, some would say even 2%. So the, the massive expansion of the human enterprise, the human population, has just completely what I refer to as competitively displaced other life forms from their habitats, from the biomass energy flows through the ecosystem that are needed to support them. So again, far from decoupling, as the human footprint expands, it means displacement of non-human life from their ecological niches, from the energy flows through the system that are required to support them. It shows up in many other ways. We, we've lost something like 70% of the remaining populations of, of wild vertebrates, not just mammals, but other vertebrates in just the last 50 years. So a massive expansion of the human system is literally a displacing other life from the planet and destroying the rest of the functional system in, in the process. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure how I got on that from your question, you, you, but you described you described eagle, you you gave us some good uh, okay, yeah, there. Yeah. you described EFA beautifully. The question was just periphery, metropolis. Yeah, okay, yeah, but of course, yeah, again, yeah. I, I did make a allusion earlier to the fact that wealthy countries and every city, every city, mm -hmm. the way we've constructed our urban environment today, cities are parasites mm -hmm. on the rest of the system. Uh, of course, they give back in some respects, the intellectual uh, <laughs> creations and so on and so forth. But <laughs> in biophysical terms, the, the, the area that the, most people think of a city in, in terms of the political or geographic area occupied by that landscape. But if you look at the material flows, the actual footprint in ecological terms of a typical large modern high income city is several hundred times larger than the, the plot on the map. 
So Tokyo, for example, you mentioned earlier, uses more bioproductivity than the entire country of Japan. Uh, Tokyo is a country of what, 38 million people in metropolitan terms. So it's, it's almost as big as Canada, a single mm -hmm. city. And so there's no way that Japan, if it were cut off from the rest of the world, could support its, its capital city, um, let alone the other three quarters of the population that don't happen to live in, in Tokyo. So there's a country utterly dependent on material flows from elsewhere on the planet to sustain its current high quality standard of life. And I don't mean to pick on Japan because virtually every country in Europe is in the same situation. But it underscores the fact that the, the central parts of the planet, the high income uh, parts of the planet are essentially drawing down the resource base, the natural capital of the periphery, as you put it, at the expense of the future potential of those areas to realize their own uh, gains. And some people would say, well, well, they're making money from the sale of these resources and then the jobs it creates and so on. But that's really at the bottom of our current income uh, triangle. So we've got an amazing problem here in which the, the global economy is basically a system is set up to pump wealth, both in physical and monetary terms, from the poorest parts of the world into the richest parts of the world. And there's no sign whatever of that abating at mm -hmm. the present time. Mm -hmm. And even economic models show that it's not obviously just a, an ecological trick of a, a sleight of hand here. here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. Do you want to go to this kind of issue about complexity? science or, or do you even yeah, have a question? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. I had questions about legs. We're not feeling some of the negative feedback that is coming our way perhaps, but we decided to open up the question a bit more and just deal with the complexity of ecological systems and um, wanted to see if we could get sort of a primer on um, these ecological systems. Um, yeah. You, you, you were saying, uh, yeah, negative, positive environmental feedback, lags, tipping points, thresholds. Yeah, all, all this language. <laughs> could you give us a little primer? You know, you said you said you said in the cognitive obsolescence piece, uh, obsolescence piece. We're, as humans, we don't get complexity, so maybe you could help us get it. These are some of the, some of the concepts. Um, yeah, could you give us a little background on wh what do you mean by lags? What do you mean by tipping points, thresholds, and and this issue of complex systems? <laughs> okay, let's. Uh, we have to make a distinction first of all between complicated systems and complex systems. An automobile engine and transmission, for example, is a complicated system. There's thousands of working parts, but it's a mechanical system. It's complicated, but if the wheel, or if the engine turns over at twice the speed, the wheels turn over at twice the speed. So there's a direct correlation between what happens in the engine and what happens in the wheels through, through the transition. And it's completely predictable. I know that if I'm in a given gear and I double the RPMs of the engine, I know that the wheels are going to turn at, at, at twice the speed. That's all there is to it. It's a simple mechanical, it, it's a complicated, but it's a mechanical system where you have immediate cause effect relationships and very direct relationships, linear relationships. A complex system is entirely different. It too may have many, many operating parts, but the domain in which there's predictability is maybe relatively constrained. Mm -hmm. So for example, uh, cl the climate system is an enormously complex system. It is characterized as we're beginning to understand by lags and thresholds. So a lag effect is an effect that is caused now, but may not appear for many decades. So some would argue that the current global mean average temperature, which is over a degree and a half above the long-term average, is actually the temperature that was set up by the carbon dioxide levels of 40 or 50 years ago. Mm. And so there's a lag in the system between the current circumstances and the ultimate effect of those circumstances. Another one is the melting of the permafrost. A little bit of warming, is causing a whole variety of, of, of relatively rapid feedback effects here. So if we warm the world a little bit, uh, first of all, there's a big concern now about the melting of the Arctic sea ice. The Arctic sea ice is like a vast mirror that reflects sunlight back into space. But as the sea ice melts, more and more sunlight is assimilated into the oceans, 
which heats up the oceans, which means the global warming continues, which exacerbates the speed at which the Arctic sea, sea ice melts. As the permafrost begins to melt with a little bit of warming, it releases methane, it releases carbon dioxide. As the permafrost melts, a vast amount of stored carbon begins to decompose more quickly, gets into the atmosphere, adding to the greenhouse effect and accelerating the warming effect. So positive feedback can be thought of as anything that is a deviation accelerating. So if global warming away from the long-term mean is a deviation, then feedback will accelerate that deviation. And I've given two examples, the melting of Arctic sea ice and the melting of, of uh, the permafrost. So those, those are positive feedbacks that increase the amount of warming. And the concern here is that we'll get into a state of runaway warming, which will be impossible to reverse, that there are so many latent uh, positive feedbacks in the system that will we'll simply lose any track of them and capacity to deal anything about them. So I want to put this in a, a different context, but it's the same sort of thing. We talk about economic growth and the growth of the population as if that's normal. And the reality is that humans have been around with what modern, anatomically modern humans for at least 250,000 years. And during 99.9% .9 of that time, growth was negligible. I mean, the only real growth occurred was the spread of humans over the face of the earth in the last 50,000 years. But local populations would fluctuate in the vicinity of their regional carrying capacities, mm -hmm. not grow. If they grew too much, they'd get slammed back by negative feedback. Mm -hmm. All right. So again, let me make a general statement for 99.99% of human evolution, our populations, the scale of the human enterprise, if you like, was held in check by a balance between the positive feedback forces of reproduction. All human populations have the capacity to grow exponentially in ideal environmental conditions, but they're kept in check by negative feedbacks scarcity, competition for space. Uh, if population gets too dense, disease spreads early, the population gets knocked back. As Europe began to develop into large cities and towns, the plague wiped them out several times in the course of the Middle Ages. So negative feedback has kept us in check mm -hmm. until, well, it was a light bump up in, with the beginning of agriculture. But the real impact occurred in the early part of the 19th century with the beginnings of the use of fossil fuel mm -hmm. and with the improvement in public health. So what public health did was reduce the death rate. What fossil fuel did was provide all the food and energy and other material resources needed to enable the population to grow. So for the very first time in human evolutionary history, certainly on a global basis, human beings were freed from most of the negative feedback that were holding our populations in check. So in the last 200 years, we went from 1 billion population. Now, keep in mind, 250,000 years to get to 1 billion. In just 200 years, what's that, 1 250th, or the 1,250th is much time, we went to 8 billion. So there's been this inordinate expansion of human numbers and the scale of human activity on the planet in just 200 years. Mm -hmm. Snap in the fingers of human evolutionary history. And yet it's that period of time that explosion when the negative feedbacks were removed and our positive feedback uh, began to work to expand the population. This is the thing that we take to be normal. Economists take this to be the norm. Every government wants growth to continue at 2 or 3%. Gets below 2%, we start to worry. Hmm. What we take to be the norm is the single most anomalous or abnormal period in human history. Mm -hmm. And it's it's Essentially, the human enterprise is suspended on a fountain of, of fossil fuel, that oil gusher. And as that fossil fuel begins to run out and there are no uh, quantitative substitutes, then the system will implode. It may not be a very rapid implosion. It may take some decades, but it will implode. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, the period in which we're heading because the negative feedback starts to play in. So we had this period of unlimited expansion 
because we released ourselves from negative feedback. The negative feedbacks are starting to kick in. Climate change is the first one. Some estimates are that a third of, of the human population may be displaced from its uh, climate niche over the next uh, several decades as the Earth warms up. Parts of the planet, large swaths of Earth may become uninhabitable by human beings. We may lose a large proportion of our agricultural landscapes because of uh, climate change effects, including desertification, uh, the drying up of groundwater supplies, or simply the overuse of groundwater, which is happening in the United States and in India and all over the place. So we're drawing down the resources while continuing to grow. But at some point, the negative feedback kicks in and uh, knocks the population and economic growth back. Mm -hmm. And I think we're beginning to see that now. And if we were truly an intelligent species and had some sense of social uh, togetherness and responsibility, uh, we'd recognize this and we'd begin to take the kinds of actions necessary to, to head off a catastrophe. We should have been doing that 50 years ago. It's a little bit late now, I'm afraid. Okay, so that's negative and positive feedback. Positive feedback is deviation accelerating, negative feedback is deviation suppressing, and the negative feedbacks are starting to kick in and, and slow down the growth of the human enterprise. Yeah, no, thanks for the articulation, Bill. Um, Thomas, is there somewhere you wanna take this right now? Um, yes. Um, um, it seems to me like our, uh, you mentioned the private property incentive people have land, they have private property, and they want to maximize the returns from that land. And our system of private property incentivizes production and continual growth. And um, I feel like um, in some ways, this private property system has created this, well, inequality between people and created this system of uh, owners and laborers and the laborers continue to be forced to uh, take the jobs that are given to them by the people that own the means of production and their incentive is to constantly use more resources. And it's partly why I imagine people have been, aren't choosing to be agricultural workers or, or farm land in ways that are more ecologically sustainable, don't profit as much. They're, people are, it seems are in a way compelled away from that behavior. Um, because of the risks of not having a retirement fund or yeah what 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 not um and so there's this interesting kind of problem of just like what we're doing with our time how how we spend our time how we try and reverse these trends seems intimately connected with our system of employment and work and just how we orient our efforts daily um and Further, I think we sent you a diagram of um, just in the chat there. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Oh, the, I didn't see that. Yeah. Yeah. Just some figures, and the third figure. Sorry, Thomas. Yeah. yeah, the, yeah. the third figure is a is a George's figure, but um, was adapted by Franklin Obangodum from the Helsinki Institute, and it describes this um, relationship between technology, growth, rent, and inequality, and they fuel each other in this cycle where technology uh, introduced into a community um, usually encourages growth of that population, which um, increases land rents. The private property owners of those lands pocket those rents, which increases inequality. Um, and they are using the labor in that region and afar to create more technology, yeah. which creates more growth, which creates higher rents and more inequality and seems to push people away from, uh, again, this dynamic of, or, or you know, more ecological ways of existing, not using, uh, it seems to incentivize uh, high energy, high complicated tech. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. And I, I just, I just, no, I'm sorry, Thomas, I just want to say, and I guess to add to that is um, you also spoke about how this is sort of a blip in human history these last 200 years and we have this now fossil fuel based acceleration in in technology and a new sort of technology so just to add to thomas's question there is there other conceptions of technology that we can sort of um reflect on that we can articulate 
um, that. Well, but you guys are raising questions that have been dealt with by philosophers and political scientists and sociologists uh, for, for hundreds of years. You've mentioned George, mm -hmm. but you know, there's Marxist views on all of this as well. Mm -hmm. um, private property is an invention of, of our particular culture. There are cultures on the planet, even now, that have no such concept of private property. Um, one is associated with, but not an owner of, say, a particular piece of landscape as long as you're alive. So there's all kinds of potential variations on the theme. It's really important to emphasize here that human beings um, don't live in reality. They socially construct the framework out of which they choose to live their lives. So modern capitalist economies, modern uh, private property, all of these are social constructs. They're products of our particular culture that, again, most of us just take for granted. Well, of course, it's private property. Well, um, I'm sorry, of course, it's not just private property. Mm -hmm. We've made it as, and there are cultures in which there was no such concept. So the, the short answer to your question is, yes, we could devise all sorts of ways of dealing with ourselves as a species in the ecosphere that doesn't involve private property rights or the appropriation of rents in the way you've described. At one point way back when, I mentioned the way we've structured the world, socially constructed the world, it's a pump of wealth from the poor to the rich. Mm -hmm. And the system of rents you're talking about is a perfect example of it. By the way, it's perfectly good positive feedback as well, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You get a little bit of money, it earns interest, you get more money, which adds to your capital, so you get more uh, wealth th through rents and, and so on. So it's it's a self-aggrandizing system. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the question of technology that you raised. Mm -hmm. I say today to somebody, hey, I'm in the tech industry. What do they think of? It's got to be computers, AI, or some other form, of, you know, maybe wind and solar power. These are high-tech industries. But I would argue they're very low-tech industries. Mm -hmm. This is what I call brute force technology. If you think of modern agriculture, it's brute force agriculture because we're forcing the land to produce by applying fertilizers in excess of the capacity of that land to assimilate. We're using pesticides, which destroys other forms of life. We're pumping, well, fossil fuels in, in the form of irrigation and uh, tractors and heavy duty equipment and all the rest of it. Yeah, it increases productivity, but you destroy the land base in the process. Now think of agroecology, agricultural ecology, or think of permaculture. These are forms of technology because mm -hmm. they use the application of knowledge, intricate, intricate knowledge of the soil chemistry, of the crop uh, varieties that would grow best in these things. How much water do they need? What's the sunlight requirement and so on and so forth. So agroecology or, or permaculture are vastly more knowledge-based systems of production mm. than is brute force agriculture, which just hammers the land to make damn sure it produces something on our behalf. But we don't tend to think in those terms. So I would argue that if you really want to get futuristic, we've got to apply our uh, low-tech systems to a much greater extent than these so-called high-tech systems, which are all dependent on vast uh, consumption of energy and materials and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. The future in agriculture is not going to be uh, the kind of mechanized high input agriculture that we see today. It will be a very much more technologically advanced form of agriculture based on, as I say, exquisite knowledge of ecosystems, of crop varieties and, and uh, all of the other things that go into producing food without destroying the productive basis of our food production. Absolutely. No, th thank you. And I, I love the the high tech, high energy, low tech, low energy um, distinction that you're pointing to. I, I, let's be clear. It's not low. It's it's high tech, low energy. <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, said that, I said that incorrectly. Yes. Well, yeah, I, I'm just trying to make the point that knowledge-based mm -hmm. production in food may be a lot better. And by the way, mm -hmm. you know, if you think of even industry, how many workers take pride in, in their work today? It goes back to some question that Thomas answered earlier. Humans have become just cogs in the industrial machine. Mm -hmm. They have no real interest in much of the work that they produce. 
So if you went back to a higher tech a form of a, the manual production of many of the things. Shoemakers, I have a shoemaker down the street here, one of the last of his breed, who takes enormous pride in the quality of the work that he does. You see what I'm saying? People could acquire some sense of real meaning out of the work that they do because they're producing real value for their customers. A lot of people have that old-fashioned bullshit. But the fact of the matter is we've lost connection with the value of our own capacity uh, to be technologically sophisticated in ways that add value to our own lives mm -hmm. as a producer and to the lives of people that we serve in the production process. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's uh, another way of looking at redesigning our community. Far less income, far mm -hmm. less energy, uh, far less consumption per se, but it may be of a higher quality. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, that builds community and, and creates relationship. Mm -hmm. that, that's a superior form of social technology than the current alienating uh, technology that puts us all in, uh, you know, little echo chambers of self-reference. Mm, yeah. Well, I think you've actually, you know, answered the question we started with beautifully is what does it mean to live well in, in, in this kind of stage of social environmental unraveling and i think you honestly hit the nail on the head it might mean something like a lower growth uh, society where we live closer to where we work where people take pride in making things um where we are more connected to our food systems in a way that we simply aren't in modern industrial technical society um it would it would mean a return to these uh old values as, as you say or you know we might say um, and, and, and again, it's, it is the challenge of, 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 of complexity. It's the challenge of thinking, um, the, a challenge, the, the, the challenge of confronting complexity, despite our cognitive obsolescence. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so I think you know, thank you. Thank you, Bill. And I just want to say, we, we only have an hour booked here and we don't want to take up too much of your time, but, but is there anywhere, Thomas, that you'd like to kind of take this in, in the time that we have left? Um, anything else you want to touch on? Um, let me think. On yeah. That. How about you? Um, well, um, honestly, I think Bill, I, I, I loved your, just hearing you articulate what EFA is, what, um, yeah, what thresholds are, what legs are, what complexity is. It, it was, uh, it's uh, that in itself was, was great for us. Um, yeah, I, um, I think we covered honestly, most of what we wanted, but there might yeah. be something. I think one maybe, of the maybe there's one point that we should raise. I just wanted to. And that is that legs are one thing, tipping points are something else altogether. Oh, yes. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so a complex system uh, is almost completely an unknown system. So we're familiar with the climate system as it has been for the last 50,000 years, let us say. Mm -hmm. But com complex systems may have several what are called domains of attraction. So the Earth's average temperature has been in the vicinity of 14 Celsius degrees for millennia. But supposing we do something that so discombobulates the, the various mechanisms that control temperature that we flip into, we cross a, a separatrix or a tipping point mm. so that the mean global temperature goes to, say, 20 degrees Celsius. Now, that would eliminate civilized existence on the Earth. Mm -hmm. But it may be a new stable equilibrium for the climate system because of the conditions we've created. So it's it's still a climate system, but it's moved from one domain of stability to another domain of stability, which may not be amicable to human existence. Mm -hmm. So that's the nature of, of, of uh, separate tricks. These are so-called tipping points. You can flip the system over so that it acquires a new state of being a, a new equilibrium state, for example, that is not um, amicable to the conditions that created it in the first place. And I think we're in some danger of doing it. We've seen this many times, by the way, in ecosystems. So it's not an unknown phenomenon, but the problem is it doesn't, you don't know that that alternative state exists until you've crossed into it. Mm. A tipping point is not necessarily visible. It's something you trip over. And if you fall into a pit on the other side, uh, too bad that you, you didn't see that pit ahead of time. Uh, we've seen this, as I say, in many, many different ecosystems over time. And if it happens at the climate level or in, in terms of the ecosystem of the ocean's warming, at what point does the ocean get so warm 
that uh, marine life suffers a major collapse and extinction is forever, a different tipping point. It mm -hmm. won't destroy life. Mm -hmm. New life will emerge in the next 10 million years or so, but it will be different from the life that existed under current relatively long-term stable conditions. Earth is a system of self-regulation, mm -hmm. but we can push it to the point where it's no longer capable of maintaining itself within its customary domains of, of stability, as it were. And so we can push the system over a tipping point. It acquires a different domain of stability, a different complement of species, a different complement of important forces and, and so on. But uh, we happen to evolve in this system and we're not going to live very well in an alternative system. It'd be like moving to Mars. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't work. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah, Tip, we had an tipping actual point. Clarified tipping point. So yeah, leg yeah. thresholds, tipping points. Thank you. <laughs> we made it. Um, yeah. So Thomas, any any other questions? Uh, what one? Yeah, maybe you have something. I have something for Bill. One last thing. Okay. Well, one thing. Um, um, and hopefully I'm not interrupting because I just want to ask Bill. Um, while we have you. Um, what 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 has it been like to be the the um the messenger of such a unpopular message uh <laughs> all, all these years um um just what's your sense of it you know and you you had you had you've had a long career um at ubc um you've been you've been shouting from the rooftops for decades um so to speak um what, what's it been like for you if i could add quickly to yeah. it it just seems to me that uh the focus on climate change um is a problem and that your work and the idea of ecological footprint um highlights a much broader perspective mm -hmm. that is harder to escape from if 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 policy mm -hmm. was to be oriented around ecological footprint yeah. analysis it would help under, us understand the limits of yeah. absolutely I, I think that's a really important point i mean i've argued recently that the, the global focus on climate change is a distraction mm -hmm. from the real problem which is overshoot climate change is just one of many many symptoms of overshoot the other symptoms include plunging biodiversity, ocean acidification, desertification, all sorts of other problems, and falling male sperm counts. Mm -hmm. All these are the result of too much consumption and too much pollution. There are too many people polluting and consuming too much. Climate change is one symptom. Mm -hmm. Our focus on climate change is an example of the simplistic way the human mind operates in a simple one-on-one -on -one linear cause effect kind of relationship. And as I say, the emphasis on climate change is distraction, not just because it's simplistic and, and, and ignores the bigger problem, but because the more we focus on climate change, the less we're solving the climate problem, mm. the more we're exacerbating overshoot. So everything we're doing to fix climate because of our fixation on it, is actually adding to the climate problem. Uh, electric vehicles are no solution to the climate problem. Wind and solar power are no solution to the climate problem. You, we think they are because we socially construct these myths about 100% renewable energy by 2050. It, it's simply not working either to solve the climate problem or to address overshoot. Uh, so some sociologists or, or ecological economists have said that the way we're approaching the climate problem involves massive investment. It's being sold on the basis of huge profit-making opportunities mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, cre uh, job creation and so on and so forth. So again, it's the self-reference back into the beliefs, values, and assumptions of techno-industrial society, which keeps perpetuating the same kind of uh, mythic constructs that are destroying the planet in the first place. Mm. Yeah. The, the solution, or the, the, the people are arguing that it, it's an attempt to make uh, growth-oriented capitalism appear to be the solution to, rather than the cause of, the problem. Absolutely. And I think that's a fatal error, and, and mm -hmm. the whole global society is involved it, in it. It doesn't take too much reflection to, to say um, sol selling more electric cars doesn't do anything that are extremely resource intensive to build will do nothing to combat overshoot if you just think about it for literally two seconds. <laughs> and and I, and I so so thank you, Bill. I think you and, and thanks, Thomas, because I think you you put the nail on the head is that especially in my own domains of environmental education, we're so ridiculously focused on climate change as the the you know the the big umbrella boogeyman there but we could be focused on 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 carrying capacity we could be focused on overshoot 
um, and it would be a very different conversation. It would be a less reductive conversation. Yeah, we, and we should be focusing on, on the socio-cultural origins of all of those ideas, because it is our the way we have structured our society, the the, the fundamental beliefs, values, and assumptions yeah, that have made human. You know, we start from a position of, of exceptionalism. Humans aren't part of nature. We aren't subject to natural laws. And if you build a whole philosophical foundation and an economy uh, based on the notion that humans are exempt from natural laws, not part of nature, you, you can't possibly uh, create anything that will last for very long. Because in fact, as I've said with our various other studies, humans are integral parts of the system and in fact are the largest consumer organism on planet Earth right now, mm -hmm. uh, displacing most other species in the process. At least most of the compete competing species. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and and I, I think you're totally right, right, Bill. And and to go beyond this story of human exceptionalism, we're going to have to find uh, ways of valuing the non-human, ways of valuing non-human species that don't look like us, bacterium that maybe don't, you know, aren't as impressive as the big panda or the big, like you know, lion or something. With, with, oh. Without those back. Yeah, without we could not survive on Earth without the bacteria and fungi. So, so I we don't see them. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, some of them infect us, but on the whole, they're absolutely essential as part of the ecosphere to keep the whole cycle in operation. So, bacteria and fungi are your friends. Don't step on any. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, well, thank well, thanks, Bill. Um, Thomas, anything else you want to say? I do have questions, but I don't want to take up too much of your time. So, oh, I'm good. Um, okay, maybe maybe one more question for Bill. How, if he, he, okay, he okay, seems okay. willing, um, <laughs> it's kind of a maybe a complex question, and this is just connecting. Uh, they all, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> personal things. Um, maybe I'll just like start this by saying that I've been, you know, just thinking about the pressure that's been put on. I'm an artist, so I've I've felt this, um, you know, economic pressure of being an artist is very difficult. The starving artist thing is very real and. There's no not much security, you know, um, and where most of us are renters. Um, but I it, it led me to this, you know, question about providing a basic income for everybody. And in a way, this idea is antithetical to getting off of money, you know, because it's this addiction to money is um, kind of part of the problem and can creating this overshoot. But I almost see it as a way of. Um, paradoxically allowing people to step back from production and start, they can pay for basic things in their economy and services, but but can do work, start new forms of work, do, do less, live off of less potentially. Um, and I see it uh, now to the question of uh, complexity again, I've, in my research, I've found that um, complex systems, usually when they're, or, Populations are small. The dynamics are very particular to that small population. But as they grow, the context changes and the dynamics of everything changes, especially in a human system, such as a human economy. And um, we are now at this big overshoot stage where things are so big, the context has really changed. And um, just thinking about also the question of education that we started with, how it's a result of this system. Mm. How do we, I'm trying to think of constraints on the system that allow us to get smaller, um, constraining this big super organism mm. in ways and that perhaps a guaranteed income where we're stopping uh, wealth from accumulating in elite's hands so much and kind of uh, distributing it more equitably would allow us to engage in activities that are different. Um, yeah, uh, I see. I see land tax as a similar thing, where it's just constraining the the possibilities of wealth accumulation, trying to stop this. Uh, and 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 finally, I guess this. Um, I, I've been trying to imagine our economy as a system of that creates inequality, and this inequality itself is sort of like a. I wonder if we could use a metaphor of equilibrium there. Like it's far from equilibrium. We have certain elite individuals that have power and control over uh, resources and land and 
that when it gets too far, it, it pushes us into towards overshoot too, because their interests are more accumulation. Um, of course. Yeah. So I'm well, just, I mean, your, your question is raising the whole structure of, of human societies. So yeah. a couple of, you made a couple of really important points, a very small constrained a community is a much easier system to organize and, and manage than is a very large complex system. It, it, in systems analysis, I think it's the the number of interactions of systems components increases as one half the square of the number of components. So it's an amazing increase in complexity as the system gets larger. So I, we, I think we are headed back toward more localized communities where people are more engaged with each other in community building and become more dependent on each other. Today, we're encouraged to be individualistic and independent of everybody else, but that's a, a product of mind and a necessity of the capitalist system. You, you've raised another question about the accumulation of wealth. Today's world is such that vested interests run the government. If you've been following the election in the United States, you know, they're, they're Amazed that the, the uh, Harris campaign has managed to raise, you know, half a trillion dollars, 500 million or something of that nature. My goodness, half a billion. I don't I forget what it's a hell of a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But the, you can't you can't get elected without being supported by multimillionaires in the United States. Even a, a regular congressman needs several million dollars to run his election campaign. And once you're in, people expect a payback for the donations they've made mm -hmm. at your campaign. So we've seen a system of, of what's called agency capture, where vested interests in maintaining the status quo have acquired the means by which that they dictate the policies that, of the uh, various regulatory agencies, as well as what comes out of Congress, for heaven's sakes. So vested interests are enormously powerful. Uh, even in, I'm not going to get into the Arab-Israeli conflict, that's a whole other ballgame, but it's the <laughs> same ballgame. that We're seeing a world controlled now by people who have an enormous stake in maintaining the current structure. Yeah. So never do people like me become uh, a little bit too loud. There's enormous pushback. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing enormous pushback right now against uh, the, the kinds of ideas that, that I'm uh, talking about. And when you get right down to it, there's never been, I think, a major society which has voluntarily decided to uh, step back, to shrink. Mm -hmm. It will shrink, but it will be an involuntary process. And it'll be with the elites kicking and screaming and going down. I mean, look at they're, they're acquiring huge bunkers in uh, New Zealand and places like this to hide out if the system does come down. So yeah, we, we've created a, a monster here and it's going to be dangerous with a flailing tail when it, when it starts to go down. Yeah. Flight of the scared elites. Yeah, no, we're, we're seeing that totally. Well, even they recognize a wonderful article a few years ago called The Pitchforks Are Coming. Yeah, it, I, yeah, written, yeah. written by an American billionaire who recognized that, look, if we keep acting this way, uh, there will be a revolution. People at some point are going to be desperate enough to rise up. And in fact, when you think about it, the major social changes that have taken place in, in the last several hundred years of our kind of metro and techno industrial culture have been through revolution, not through gradual education and, and all of that sort of thing. No, you're right. Wow. So, so maybe th thank you for responding to that um, question. So, so, so maybe the the final point is, yeah, how, what's it been like to to be the the conveyor of such an unpopular message for forty plus years? Um, do you do you have anything to say? <laughs> Your experience? Uh, look, <laughs> yeah, I, I, look, I've had a wonderful academic career. I, I have to say, I've been supported financially enough to get by with my students. I've been called every evil name in the book. I'm a neo-Nazi, a neo-Malthusian, eco-terrorist, and so on and so forth. I don't take it personally. This is the, the dialogue that goes on in any uh, society. There are places in the world where, of course, it's, it's becoming increasingly difficult to speak up. Journalists are being slaughtered by thousands in many parts of the world uh, now, including, uh, for that matter, in, in, in Palestine. So. I'm not a journalist, but you get the point that it, if an unpopular perspective starts getting out there, 
uh, the system will respond to put it down. Mm -hmm. And I'm not popular enough or well-known enough to, to be put down. So in many respects, I think academics are merely tolerated. They feed us enough um, research funding to keep us going and out of off the street, so to speak. But we're not yet a major danger to the system. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I, I just want to make this point on overshoot. I've gone to every major CBC program from uh, what on earth to the, the current, uh, the National News Service with, with articulate pleas to, you know, look, tease this climate thing apart a little bit. You're focusing on climate, 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 climate. Mm -hmm. I got one response from, a, I guess, a researcher with the, uh, the the current in the morning. And she is very excited, read a number of my papers, put together a nice little case for bringing it forth on, on the current and said, I'm going upstairs with this. I'll be back at you. Never heard of her again. <laughs> so there's just no interest, you see, in getting the conversation to move in directions that are unfamiliar, that are off the beaten track. Mm -hmm. uh, it's we don't want to think people do not want to think mm -hmm. uh, the way I do I say the glass is half empty others say oh no it's half full and we're getting better all the time <laughs> so, to say listen no we're not getting better all the time it's it's a figment of your measurement system and, and your imagination you have to start looking at other variables that in the long run mean a great deal more but we don't think in the long run because we're natural discounters. So again, just this way of thinking about reality is unpopular mm -hmm. because it forces your nose into uh, smelly situations that you wouldn't otherwise care to visit. Mm -hmm. Well, such a such a pleasure, Bill. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Yeah, no, and that, no, and you've been tolerated. I like I like that message. You, you've been tolerated for decades. <laughs> not taking it uh, seriously, let's... though. Yeah, dying. Well, yeah, not by. I want to be clear. There's lots of other people like me out there working on this all the time, but we as a collective are tolerated. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I, by the mainstream, mm -hmm. as I say, because we are not yet perceived as a significant danger. To the status quo i mean i think you said it all i mean there's a whole new cbc program called what on earth and it's dedicated it's a national program dedicated to talking about climate change but mm -hmm. they can't really talk about it from your side of things they well, are they, yeah you're right i mean as i said when i contact they, they, i don't even get a response the only system the only cbc entity that responded was the current mm -hmm. and, and that came to a dead end in the end so Mm -hmm. Wow, jeez! I find it interesting that you targeted the CBC. I find them a source of public education in a way. They're responsible for such, you know, knowledge mobilization efforts because they're tax funded and they should be taking responsibility. I think the CBC is afraid of its budget, mm -hmm. and I mean the the likely next government of Canada. We'll, we'll chop that budget. The government that will eliminate the CBC or cut its budget drastically because of the dangerous ideas every now and then that it, that it dares to put out. And I, I think the CBC in many respects is a failure because mm. of its own fear of exactly that. Mm. I, I, I'm overstating this. Well, maybe not. I don't know. It's hard to know. It, uh, other people see it differently. I recently got a very long letter from... Um, the head of the news at, at CBC because I complained about their coverage of the uh, U.S. election, the way they had slammed Biden, 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 without even pointing out, I thought at any rate, the, the enormous idiocy of, of Trump. Um, at least I, I saw there was a new balance there, and I was roundly condemned for ignoring a whole bunch of programs I've never heard of on the obscure CBC outlets that, that apparently gave much more equal balance to the treatment of Trump and uh, Biden at the time. Anyway, that's an aside. Yeah, no, so no, you can argue about the CBC forever, but I've not been yeah. really well received there. No, mm -hmm. I, I, I think that just in itself says a lot. So that's the main point, really. Yeah. Um, well, th well, thank you so much, Bill. Um, thanks for fielding these diverse questions, you know, some of them circling around education, but also other other aspects of your work and 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 its implications. Um, and various things that I'm not even really that familiar with. So yeah, <laughs> various things that we, we see connections to your work and we just want yeah, to yeah, yeah. them up. But, th but thank you so much. And um, 
And um, yeah, and we'll we'll keep you posted as and hopefully getting something like this focus group together. We we would we would love to have you know your voice there and 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 guiding everyone. So so we'll keep you posted on on how that comes together. Um, you know, funding, just waiting for funding. Pursuing, oh, sure. You, you know how it goes. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So thank, thanks so much, Bill. Yeah, no, such a pleasure. My pleasure. Take yeah. care, gentlemen. We'll take, take care. care. Okay. Good luck, both of you. Thank thanks you. Thank so you much. so much.